Okay, so uh, shall we get going again? Uh, now, the previous speakers have told you uh, how to get published. Well, I'm going to do the reverse now, so I think I've been rejected. So, that's what I'll do. Pretty good success. Is that? <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, I've been lucky in the sense I've managed to publish uh, lots of work in ICE journals and also been editor of a few journals uh, for a while, still doing a bit of work. So fortunately, I hope to share some of this experience with you. Uh, this is one picture of the, uh, what looks like. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, That's good. Now, have any of you, well, I don't know if you've, uh, have any of you, uh, Hands up those who have never been rejected. <laughs> good. Well, that's a good sign. Because uh, the only way to avoid getting rejection is what? Not submit, exactly. Not to submit anything. So I'm glad that you've got some rejections. That's a good sign. If you don't have any, then that's a really bad sign. Uh, so, what I'll do is, based on my experience as uh, my own work, of course, uh, I get some rejection as well, and uh, we all do. And but particularly as a senior editor of some of our journals, MISQ and ISR and other ones, uh, some common themes have emerged over the years. It happens over and over again. And so what I want to do is share what these themes are, what are the most common problems that people have, so why they reject it, but then the, the, the key part, of course, of the uh, uh, presentation is, well, how can you avoid making those same mistakes? Some of the things have already been talked about before uh, by, um, you know, by Robert and Walter and so forth, but I'll put a different, slightly different spin on it uh, uh, from what they said and then give some practical suggestions. So that's uh, my idea. And I'm happy to take questions at any time, by the way. So please interrupt me at any stage. So first of all, why they're rejected. And in my experience, there are always two main reasons, over and over again. People say, the reviewers, the AE, the editor will say, well, it's not really clear what is new. What is the contribution here? You know, every paper should have a new contribution to knowledge. So people, the reviewers say, well, I can't see what it is. I don't know what is new here. So that's the first thing. And of course, every journal, particularly the top journals, they want to have the newest thing, the latest thing. They want the new idea. If it's old hat, not interested. Just not interested. In fact, you know, in science, we have this idea that we, we should be able to replicate things. You know, that's the whole idea, right? If you can prove something here, you should be able to prove it over here. But guess what? The top journals are not interested. They're not interested in replication because it's not interesting. It's boring. And so if you're, say, if you're doing a replication study, oh, someone did this and I'm replicating over here, other journals will accept that. Now, I mean, you know, the B or C journals might like it, but certainly not MISQ and ISR. In fact, they explicitly state they don't accept those papers. So, what's new? That's the thing. There's got to be something new. And then secondly, from a uh, um, especially qualitative research, but actually even quantitative research as well, the story is not convincing. So, it just doesn't, not convincing. I've talked to uh, senior editors of like a journal like Management Science, which only publishes quantitative research. <coughs> And they say the same thing to me. Look, in fact, in management science, every paper has to have a good story. But we tell that story with numbers. But it still needs a good story. So every paper's got to have a good story that convinces the reader it's good, you know? It's, it's, uh, uh, and so that's the idea. 
So anyway, those are the two main reasons. There's lots of other ones as well, but they're, they're the two that come up over and over again. So I'm going to go into more detail now as to what these problems are. So the first one is the lack of focus or a contribution. Now, every paper should have just one main point. You've only got 20 pages of journal article, so you can't do everything. And that's the problem, with, of course, with your PhD thesis. The PhD thesis is usually a book, uh, and you've got many points. You've got lots of things you want to say. The problem is, if you try and say all those lots of things in one paper, lack of focus. You're trying to solve all the world's problems in one paper. <coughs> and so it's not clear what the main point is. So that's one pr problem, is that often there's many points but each article is just a piece of a puzzle. So a, a metaphor I like to use is that of a jigsaw puzzle. Imagine a jigsaw puzzle. Now at the moment, uh, there's a lots of pieces on the board already. You know, uh, other scholars have published a paper on this, someone else has published a paper on that, and it fits together, but the jigsaw puzzle isn't finished. Now you need to find that one point, that one piece that just fits in the right spot. It's got to be the right shape. In other words, it's got to be based on, you know, it's got to be based on the current picture that's there. That's what people are already doing, what they've already done and what they've published. It's got to fit, it's got to be the right picture, not a different jigsaw puzzle, that's no good. It's got to be the right piece in a sense and it's got to be able to be a piece that's missing if someone's already put the piece on the board already done it well it's not interesting it's already done um, so it has to be that one but just that one point is the is the key thing I think uh, but of course it's only a metaphor this board is never finished it's always moving so it's like a jigsaw puzzle that keeps going off in different directions and and so forth but you still need to get it on at the right time. You know, that's key. If you're a bit too late, it's already there. If you're a bit too early, that's no good either because there's no way to put it. There's nothing to join it to. You're out on a limb. So that's another problem is you could be way off, you know, not at the right time. <coughs> and that relates to the next point about literature review, and that was mentioned before, um, about literature review, inadequate. Now, um, that's sort of a wicked problem in a way, or can be, because um, now if, if, if I say to you, okay, you need to have your literature right up to date, because this one point is going to be a new point, a new contribution, but the only way we know it's new is if you're already, you know, got the, you've already laid out the pieces on the board in your literature view, we know what's already been done. But the problem comes here, and this sort of wicked problem, uh, particularly for, for PhD students, I think, and that is um, if you go to your library right now, or go online, Google Scholar or whatever, and you get the latest article from MIS Quarterly, just hot off the press in the September issue, how old is that article? <laughs> probably four to five years old <laughs> because it took it was waiting a year for it actually from the time it was accepted to actually get out in print then it was in the review process probably for two years if you're lucky if you're lucky sorry yeah some of mine have been in for long, longer than that um, and then when did the per people the authors start the project few years before that. So in fact the idea, <coughs> the point that they wanted to make was thought of probably seven, six or seven years ago. Because when I write a paper now, uh, the very first starting point with a PhD student is I'm already thinking what's the point? What is the main point? Where's it going to fit here? 
So the idea starts way back ages ago. Um, so anyway, so the wicked problem is, so if you're basing your literature review on the latest stuff published in the latest top journals, you're already behind. You're behind. Because the people that wrote that article have long since moved on. So you know, it might get published this year, 2014, but a year or two ago, they were already working on the next one. They knew the paper was going to be accepted, or they were revising it and hoping it would get in, but they've already moved on to the next thing. So the problem is that the, the, the top scholars that are publishing in these journals, they're ahead of the game because they've already moved on to the next thing. So you're behind. It's a really wicked problem. It's like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Uh, so I'm going to try, uh, ex maybe suggest how you can overcome that problem. But that's the, uh, and so that leads to the next one though. Uh, <coughs> the manuscript, yes. Excuse me, like, Sorry? Like, I'm um, still on the second bullet. You know, like, how do you know then when the adequate literature review is done? That's a very good question. How do you know? And I'll, in my next slide, I'll tell you how you can overcome that problem. So I'll just hang on for a minute and I'll tell you. Um, <clears throat> so, so the uh, related point is it's not sufficiently new or original that's related to this previous one, but it's just a bit too late. It's just been done, or people are not that interested anymore. Uh, that's sort of a related problem, really, to this. You know, it's like the jigsaw puzzle, and the pieces of all, all the boards already moved in this direction. But you're answering this point back here, and it's already been done, really. And then the last one is what comes up again all the time. It doesn't contradict conventional wisdom. That is, particularly for top journals, what they want is something that says, well, look, we thought it was this, but really it's that. So it contradicts what we know already. If it just, as I say, replicates what we know, business as usual, then who, you know, they don't really care that much. But if, but of course you've got to be careful here. <laughs> this is a certain trick to this because what you don't want to say is, look, all you guys have done all this work here, it sucks, and I'm doing this. That's a great way to get rejected because you're just telling your reviewer, who's probably one of those people, that their research sucks. So you don't do that. There's a way of phrasing it that says, what I do, for example, is you've got to be politically correct when you write these things. You say, all these people, they've done all this wonderful stuff. Fantastic. But... And that's how you do it. So you compliment them first, say, yeah, great stuff, guys, but this is where you got it wrong, or this is where I think it can be improved. Um, so anyway, that's uh, the, the problems with uh, lack of focus or contribution. The next one is more to do with the, the story. And this is especially important with qualitative work, but in fact, important to quantitative as well. But particularly if you're doing qualitative work, usually we want some depth to the story, not superficial. You know, I, I get these comments all the time. People say, the story is, is like the official story, but we don't really get the nuances of what's going on. So particularly with in-depth qualitative work, like ethnography or something like that, we want to have those nuances, those disagreements. You know, the world is not, you know, everyone doesn't agree. And if it looks like a nice rosy picture where it's all going sweetly and well, well, it's not really very believable. So, you know, the, the depth, need to do the work. This is really what Walter was talking about before too, about you have to actually do the research and talk to people, do the interviews and so forth. And people are asking for more and more things all the time nowadays. Um, and again, if you're doing qualitative research and interpretive research, you are the research instrument. 
you know, you are the one collecting the data, so we need to know what you've done, you know, what you've been up to and who you talk to and so forth. Um, and there just needs to be this, uh, you know, thick description. Uh, uh, and it needs to be told in an interesting way. You can have a mass of data, but you can tell it in an interesting way, or you tell it in a boring way. And there's, there's different styles, different techniques you can do to try and make it interesting. But it has to be interesting. So these are the, the, the two main problems that come up all over and over again. It wants to do with uh, focus, contribution, and secondly, the story, the data. So let's look at how we can solve some of these problems. And, and the first one is actually quite simple. Um, the purpose of this paper is, you should be able to say that, just like that, what the point is. And, and if you find that yourself using multiple sentences and you start rambling, it takes you a whole five minutes to explain what you're doing, uh, then you haven't got it. You haven't got a paper yet. And that's the, a, a, a trick, really, that you, um, is really quite important, I think, that, that um, you should be able to crisply say what the point is uh, in one sentence. And if you're rambling for a while, then you know you, you're not very clear yourself. And if you're not clear yourself, then, you know, obviously it's impossible to convince somebody else you've got something new. So that's important. Uh, and it's a really good skill to get good at summarizing things very concisely. In fact, in Auckland now we've, well, for a few years now, we've had a competition for our PhD students. It's called the three minute PhD, I don't know if you have that, but it's really good, I think. Fantastic. Because when you're doing a thesis, you've got all the stuff flying around in your head, everything is important. It's all a bit confused, but if you can say what you're doing in three minutes, it's a really nice skill. But you've got, for a paper, of course, for one journal article or a conference paper, you have to be even more precise because it's just, it's not the whole thesis, it's just, you know, one piece of it. So that's um, another thing I find nowadays is that it's sort of reverse logic. I used to think that. I'll do a research project, then I'll think of what papers come out of it at the end. Now I turn it around the other way. That is, I'm thinking from day one, what is the, you know, if I'm going to collaborate with someone, I'm already thinking, who is interested in this? Who likes this topic? Who are the people? So if I think of grounded theory, I automatically know the people doing grounded theory in our field. I know who to think of. So I've got a grounded theory paper with one of my students. I almost know who's going to be the reviewer. I can pick them. You know, I know who they are. So it pays to know who is interested in it, what the topic is, and what you find is that in our field, there are groups of people doing different things. Like there's some people interested in critical research, some people interested in grounded theory, there's some people interested in case study research, doing positivist case research, there's some people doing interpretive research, these groups of people all around the place. And uh, of course the benefit of the, that we have, I suppose, as <coughs> guys been around a bit longer, is that we know who those people are. Might not know the new ones, but at least we know the old guard. And it makes a big difference knowing who those people are, because then you can write for those people. So you sort of imagine them when you're writing. What do they like? And that, um, so this is the next point, the literature review. If you know who's interested, say, in grounded theory, and you've got a great, you're doing grounded theory for your PhD, and you're, uh, you know, you're going to be uh, submitting it to an IS journal, well, pretty smart move to actually quote some of the people that have done work in grounded theory. Now you might think, well, that's just sucking up to them. Well, yes, you can see it that way. But the other way, I think of it the other way. 
If you don't cite them, what does that say? It means you're not interested in what they're doing. It means uh, you're basically ignoring uh, what's been done in our field. And if these are key figures in, if other people think these are key figures in, in the ground theory in the IS, why ignore them? You know, are you part of the conversation or not? So I see this as a, I think uh, Shirley mentioned this yesterday, she used the phrase, uh, it's a social, um, social process. And I see this whole thing as a social process. You know, the, the, um, when you're doing your PhD and it has to be examined, how many people do you have to convince that it's a good piece of work? How many? Just two. Yeah, usually only three. I say maybe two or three. Depends on your rules, regulations. Just a couple of people. That's all. But the thing is, it's those people that decide. They are people. It's not some sort of objective process in the sense that they just, you know, you just feed into a machine and it pops out the result. It's actually people reading your stuff and saying, do they like it? Do they think it's good? Or, and so forth. So the whole process is, in a way, is, is see it as subjective. It's all these people doing things, but it's important to be part of the community. So this literature review, what it's actually doing, it's showing if you are part of this community. Are you part of this social process? But remember the problem I mentioned before is that if you're only citing the stuff in the journals right now, you're behind. So, how, so coming back to your question, how are you going to fix that problem? Sorry? Yep, that's one of them here. The next point, reviewing. You need to get in early. Somehow, you've got to game the system so that you're, you know, aware of what's happening earlier rather than later. And one way is to be a reviewer. Now, and uh, I think Walter mentioned that this morning. But the thing about reviewing, a lot of students, they say, oh, no, I'm too busy. I don't have time to review other people's work. What's wrong with that logic? You are not reading. <laughs> you are not reading others' work. Exactly. You're not reading it. You're not up to date with what people are doing now. But another thing I found is that it's actually a counterintuitive logic. That, you know, I've done hundreds of reviews in, in, my, you know, in my career. But the more reviews you do, the better you get at actually writing your own work. Because you see the common problems. You know, when you're doing it yourself, you don't realize the mistakes you make. But someone else does. And so the more reviews you do, the better you get at picking the common problems. And so I find I actually write much better now because of you know, the reviews I've done. So actually counterintuitive. The more you do, the better you get at your own stuff. So if you never do any, you'd never get to know what other people are doing. You'd never know what reviewers think, how they think, how the editorial process gets done, how Robert decides to accept or reject a manuscript. You'd never get to know that. But by being part of the process, the social process of convincing other people that you've got a point. You know, you've got a point you want to make. Well, this whole process helps you to figure that out, how to do that. Because it's quite hard, actually, to convince people that you've got something new. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, the thing is, you know, um, particularly the senior people in the field have been around for a while. Uh, they'll normally say, I've heard it all before. What's new? And that's the tricky part, you know, how, how you can convince them. So this is where the next point comes in about academic conferences. 
I, I always keep reminding my dean that we need money in our department for, for people to attend conferences. And uh, one of the reasons I've always found it really good, well, first of all, it's the one place where you get to meet up, like this one, you know, fantastic idea to have these sort of events. You get to meet other people. You get to know what they're doing, like we've seen the posters and we see what people are up to. So uh, you just get to know what's happening in the field. So that's really important. So if you're working, let's say, on a particular topic, um, e-government, some of them are on e-government out here, or mobile commerce, whatever it is, you should be going to places where people are working on that sort of stuff. So, and finding out who are the top scholars in working on that area. And if you go along to the conference where they're presenting, hopefully, you might even, you know, if you ever make a comment or something in their paper, maybe they'll say, well, that was a good comment, I never thought of that. You might get to talk to them. Now, that's what I did, that's how I got my start, really. Um, I went to an ISIS conference way back in, uh, that's too far, it's longer, um, 92, 1992. I happened to hear a presentation, a panel session, by a uh, few people. One of them happened to be Heinz Klein. Uh, never met the guy before. And I was really excited about what he said. So I went up and chatted to him afterwards. I said, oh, look, I chat, 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 chat. And we got on well. Went, to, went ended up going having a beer together. He ends up coming to Auckland on sabbatical. We write a paper. And, you know, and uh, le I learned so much from him. Just and all because I went to that conference and had a chat. And then and all my collaborations are like that with every person, whether it's Kathy or Kathy Urquhart or um, no matter who it is, uh, I've met, usually met them always at conferences. Got chatting, there's a, uh, sometimes it doesn't work out, but other times you just really get on well with people and you click and um, you just, you know, get along well. And so this is where this point comes in here co-author with a more senior colleague. Because what I found is, um, I think Walter mentioned it was a, is like a game, in a good sense. You need to know the rules of the game. Now this is a very difficult game to win, I think. Getting harder all the time, actually. But if you think of the Olympics, I suppose, you know, a lot of people have done it before. Someone who's done it before knows what's what's required. And so I think it's much easier to learn from someone else who's been there, done that before, and what it takes to convince people that you've got a good idea. So I always recommend you co-author with um, you know, your supervisor, or uh, in first instance at least. Um, I've seen a few students who uh, don't do that. And they, I was a bit like that actually myself. I sort of, when I was doing my PhD, I th thought I was smart, I could do it myself. Uh, but by myself, I never actually did much with my PhD, to tell you the truth. Surprisingly, never, ne nothing much got out at all. Uh, I learned later in life that it's much better to collaborate. Um, and uh, so that was a lesson for me. And um, co authoring with people. So in my case, it was a few people like Heinz and Richard. Learned a lot from that. Richard Baskerville learned a lot from those guys. And, um, and that's more fun as well, collaborating with people. Now, PhD can be quite lonely, I think, sometimes. You're sort of on your own, doing stuff by yourself. But as soon as you start talking to people and you have a spark with someone else, all of a sudden it becomes more fun. It's much better, I think. And, and particularly, my best co-authors, like Heinz Klein, for example, um, we disagreed a lot. But that was the fun. The fun wasn't me trying to convince Heinz I was right and vice versa. And that's where the real fun came, was in the disagreements, actually, and, and working those out. And, and the, I think the sum is greater, you know, is, is greater than the parts, some of the parts. The whole is greater than some of the parts. Well, I think, anyway. So these are some ways of... Um, addressing the contribution. And the key, another key one is, it's really wrapped up in all this, because it's a social process, it's talking to people. 
So you convince your co-author you've got something new, but can you convince other people? And if you find that when you talk to people they're not really that interested, then it's probably not such a good idea. But if you find people say, oh yeah, that sounds really good, then you know you're onto something. So, you know, talk to people and try, try your ideas out. Then the second thing about the, the story, uh, you know, you need to do the work, as we said earlier today. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you're not gonna, it's not going to fly really if you don't do the hard work. Another good technique is uh, always include quotes. If you're doing interviews, include quotes from people uh, and add richness to the paper. Because, you know, if you've interviewed a senior manager from somewhere, a government department, well, you've got that. That's your data. And that's what they said. So it gives credibility to your findings and to the story. It makes it more interesting. Don't overdo it, but at least have some quotes I think is really good. And of course, describe what you did and how your research should be evaluated. Particularly if you're doing something new. If you're doing something that's been done already, well, maybe you don't need to do that. But if you're doing something completely new, uh, uh, then that could be important. Like, for example, I think um, Anastasia, I think you, you came up with a new term, relational ethnography. Well, maybe that's a different spin on a type of ethnography. So in that case, you need to say, well, how it's different. And maybe it's a different set of criteria for evaluating that than, say, confessional ethnography. So, you know, that's what you would do. So, some practical suggestions. And the first one is, I have this motto, I learned this from Lynn Marcus many years ago, and that is, uh, research is not finished until it's published. That's my motto. So, what that means is that uh, you've just finished your PhD, it's not finished. It's not done. Until you get, I tell all our students, because I'm you know, chair of our department, I want every single student to do at least one paper from their thesis. Actually, master's thesis as well. Master's or PhD. You must get at least one. And uh, at the bare minimum, a good conference paper, like a ACES paper or ISIS or something like that, a PAXIS, but ideally a journal article. And, um, now the reason for that is a few reasons. First of all, that uh, it's motivational to start with. But, but yes? After they finish the book. Or it could be during? No, before they finish. It, even better before you finish, yeah. In fact, uh, we've uh, recently, about two years ago, changed the rules, uh, regulations in Auckland for the PhD. It used to be the all, all you could do was the book. Now we've got you know, the, what we call the three paper thesis model. Have you got that as well? Yeah. yeah. We did about two years ago. And my first student actually just went through, um, oh, well, it was actually a year ago now, with uh, actually had five papers, four conference papers, you know, ICE-1, ISIS, PAXIS and stuff, AMSAs, I think. And uh, one was a journal article, not yet accepted, but which was submittable, if you like, to a, a good journal. Yeah, so I like that model, actually, uh, personally. Because, you know, if you talk about getting, if you want to get an academic job nowadays, um, the PhD is necessary, but not sufficient. In, yeah. I was doing it with a master's student because I thought the student might pay more attention to the reviewer's comments than they did to mine. Right. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the other nice thing about the having it reviewed beforehand is that you do have this external validation, at least, that you're onto something. You know, if they say it's, you know, this is nice and so forth, then it's quite good to have that feedback. Um, but also, it means that uh, as a uh, you know supervisor of my students. Um, I usually don't give up until we've got at least one paper out uh, with them. Uh, once, in fact, I did give up. They had a Paxis paper, and we never got a journal article out. 
and I gave up in the end after about f uh, a few goes. But anyway, it's one of those things. Usually, I try not to give up. Um, start writing as soon as possible, never too soon. And a lot of people make the mistake of this this third point here, writing and thinking. Some people think, well, I need to get my thoughts straightened out first, and then I'll write it down. Wrong. What's wrong about that? You forget. You forget? No, you only know what you know once you put it down. Yeah. Can I see my excuse? It's like when I think and think and think, and when I don't write anything, you know, like sometimes I feel very frustrated. But like when I start writing, whatever I write, even it is 2,000 words rubbish, that gives me a kind of satisfaction. At least I have something there, probably in, in your word, yeah, objective see, there. Yeah. So at least some rubbish is better than no rubbish, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Robert. There are studies in cognitive science showing that you need to write in order to think. And this would make sense of the comments or what you're, you're saying. It doesn't matter what you write, right? If you've got a mental block, just write. It, it, something will come. And as a result of forcing the brain to create words, then that will help the process of getting going. <coughs> Did they say something specifically about handwriting? No, it's not no. specifically about handwriting. But it depends, you know, like... Maybe it, it, it's the act of forming it's words. It's the articulation. That's your brain. Yeah. Thinking and lack of connection. So thinking and writing or writing and thinking, both of them is kind of connection. Ah. So you lose the connection. Yeah. I have, got a, I have got a question actually. You know, like during your PhD, when you have got your data, like if you start focusing on publication, you know, like without having uh, enough analysis of whatever you have got, would that be too early or? No, you can you can write a paper from your literature review. Yeah. Get that published. Your literature review is a yeah research in progress paper. Ideas, but no data. Yeah, yeah. So going back to this writing and thinking uh, thing, my motto now is actually I got it from a, a guy I wrote about writing up quality of research, Walcott. But in his book he has this phrase: writing is thinking. Writing is thinking. Because what it is, when you think about it, <laughs> you, you write it down. As soon as you write it down, now you can start editing it. You can actually start playing with it. So it's much better to get some, as you say, some rubbish down, get some stuff down. But then you can start playing with it. It's much easier once it's down to start moving stuff around and editing. But if you haven't got anything down, you're trying to do too much work in your head. So it's much better off to write. But then also, you need to write a good story. So this is where you, know, the, you should be able to explain the, the point quite concisely, each picture of one point. But there should also be a story that goes with it. And so can you, is it an interesting story? And I think that's what you need to get, you know? A story that, I mean, obviously, you have to find it interesting. If everyone else finds it boring, it's not too good. But hopefully, you've got an interesting <laughs> story that other people find interesting as well. And you can tell. If you start talking to someone, and their eyes start to glaze over and start yawning, then you know you haven't got it. But if they perk up, oh, OK, then, then you know you're onto something. Um, And uh, keep trying to improve it before you submit it. Uh, and then this rejection revise uh, process. Um, you know, as I said to start with, if you if you don't want to, if you don't like being rejected, and this is the wrong career for you, because we all get rejected. You see, I have a question. Why do you say? Sometimes they'll allow you that if it's a, 
the usual use of the phrase is it has to be a different paper. If it's just a few minor tweaks, then no, you cannot send it back. It has to be a different paper. I mean, I'm not sure what percentage is, but you know, <coughs> substantial changes. Yeah, recently, I got a paper rejected, but I think the reviewers have misunderstood the message. Like, you know, I haven't made it very clear. So I feel embarrassed. I didn't know, make that, make that yeah. very clear. But I still think that the paper, and they said that the paper is interesting and the focus is very oh, that's good. Lucky, but they have asked me to submit to another journal. I'm a bit sad. <laughs> I'm just thinking, can I actually go back and retrieve the paper and revise it and send it to the same journal because I'm so interested in publishing this thing? Won't be a good idea. Did they invite you to submit a new version? No. They didn't? They didn't. No, I think you've. I think that boat has sailed, that ship has sailed, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, when um, I remember uh, actually 20 years ago now, was I submitted my very first journal article to uh, Information Systems Research, ISR, my very first article. I submitted it there after spending a sabbatical at, uh, uh, at, in the US at Claremont Graduate University. And it came back, it was about hermeneutics and a few things and stuff, and it was rejected. And I was really angry because I said, the reviewers, they just do not understand what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and so I put the, in those days I had a filing cabinet, so I put things you know, away. And there it sat for months. And then later on, it actually took about a year later, no, it was 93, sorry, 93, I did that. Then 94, I took it out again. Finally got over my annoying, uh, how angry I was, finally got over it. And uh, revised it and sent it to another journal. Oh, accepted with revisions, minor revisions. Fantastic. And now I look back at that at what I was like 20 odd years ago, and I think, um, whose fault was that? That yeah. it was my fault. Yeah. It was true the reviewers didn't understand what I was trying to do, but it was my fault that I didn't explain it well enough. So it actually wasn't their fault. You know, I blame the reviewers, and it's easy for us to do that. It's, it's very easy, actually. It's like a nice way out to say, the reviewers are wrong. They just don't get it. And that's what I did 20 years ago. I hardly ever say that now. Now when I get these rejection letters and they say this, usually I find that the sooner I can agree with them, the better. As long as I stay mad with reviewers, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm just, it's like denying reality. I think I'm good but they don't appreciate me, you know? It's their fault, not mine. And it's, it's just a, a crazy way of thinking. When, you, when I, I think back now, how immature I was, you know? I guess I was younger and so forth then. But anyway, I think the sooner you can uh, realize that and take the criticisms on board and say, right now, how can I once you understand what, where they're coming from, and that can be difficult sometimes, where they're coming from, why are they saying that? So how, do I, how can I then overcome their objections? So that's the trick, I think, is to convince them. So my attitude nowadays is, as long as I get a revise and resubmit, even if it's major revisions, I think, fantastic. At least now I'm in a conversation with these people. But if you get rejected, well, then you've, you've lost the opportunity, unfortunately. You, you're done. You know, you've lost it. So the thing is to improve it as much as possible before you submit. So how can you do that? So if you really wanted to get into this journal, what should you have done beforehand? Round bike session. Yep, getting some workshop it beforehand, like at these sort of venues, get some feedback. Yeah. I someone someone has to read it. Yeah. Somebody 
Critical friends are hard to find, aren't they? Because usually, if we're friends with someone, we won't really tell them how it is. This really sucks, I'm sorry. We don't tell them that. We say, oh, it's nice, and you know, do a little tweak here, and a little tweak there, but really we're not helping them, right, to get, it's kind, we feel it's kinder to do that than to really tell, look, hey, look, you've really got to fix this, you know? Exactly. Lobbying, I'd say, good idea. Not sure, but well, possibly, but the trouble is um, the review process is supposed to be anonymous. So you've got to be careful in the sense that you don't want to sort of let the whole world know what you're doing, because then when it comes out to review, they say, well, everyone knows who you are. You know, it's supposed to be blind review. So that's the other thing you've got to be careful of a little bit, I think. Yeah. Is there a problem like if you're a reviewer and you read it and you kind of already know who it is? Should you just continue or should you want the uh, to like a very simple as well? You if you if you only realize it once you start reading the paper, you could tell the um, editor there's a you know potential you know who it could be. So you should tell them at least. I've had that problem before. Usually they say, well, every time I've done that, they've said, I'll oh, just go ahead anyway. Because like nowadays, if you don't need like, car in your pocket, you also don't do it, you just get some ideas and hurry up from the name, some of the others just pop up because they the conference that they work together. Yeah. Some are not blind, though. Some change their policy sometimes? Some change their policy. Like ISR at one point, under one editor, uh, changed it to single blind. Uh, but then they, when Samba was appointed, uh, uh, it changed back to double blind again. So these things come and go. <coughs> so anyway, uh, the thing is that uh, artists like your thesis and everything else, just keep refining it, revising it, and keep working on it until you're ready to submit it and, and hopefully you get a, re a revised decision back. You, I've never yet seen any article say to a top journal it gets accepted straight away. It's just not possible. Uh, yes? Yeah, yeah like, <laughs> you know, like maybe it's uh, uh, in, in IS you may have a small community there for you, you like you may get the same review or again but in anthropology and sociology, like there is a big world and people are like, you may get different reviews. What, what I tried recently, you know, like, I got my paper rejected from one journal. <laughs> I took that a bit and sent to the another one. And they, they made a kind of, uh, they, they sent the, the, the paper to the reviewers. I got some minor comments and I have resubmitted, you know, like for the publication. And I don't know that it, whether that is a kind of fair game or not. Uh, what's your view on that? Uh, so I'm not quite sure what you're asking me to comment on. Like, is, it, is that, uh, yeah, you know, like, how do you see that practice? There is some meeting with some tweaks to on the paper. Is that fair or? To, to a different journal, you mean? Yeah. You can do that. My, my personal philosophy is that it's best to try and improve it as much as possible before you do that. So I've always tried to, you know, if you get some good comments back, and, I mean, let's say you, you get some comments back and you just ignore them, then, you know, what's I mean, the point of that? I mean, uh, it seems to me that our whole, um, uh, you know, our venture that we're involved in is knowledge creation and knowledge discovery and so forth. And a lot of that comes by, you know, there's this phrase, iron sharpens iron, actually in the Bible, iron sharpens iron. Well, it's by disagreeing and by you know, having these uh, things that we actually, you know, make progress, I think. So if you just ignore it, then it shows you're not really taking it seriously, I don't think. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's just a comment on, on reviewing. Um, I know some people have this experience with journals. I have experience with the ARC. Uh, I review one year, uh, 
course and I'm, I'm one of the leaders for ESC. And I rejected the proposal and I gave some ideas. The following year, I get exactly the same proposal. Mm -hmm. Different title, but exactly the same, which makes my work extremely easy. I just copy what I did <laughs> previously and put it back. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is you would not believe how small things really are. Mm. So it is likely that you get, maybe you send it to a similar sort of a journal, and this person is also a reviewer of that journal. Mm. Because that person is publishing in the same field as you are, mm. the same type of research. Yeah, so exactly. Likely, yeah. yeah. And actually, I want to just comment on one thing that Robert said earlier today. Remember, he was talking about um, um, the focus of your paper. If it's just, I mean, if you think, say, if it's something on, uh, well, I might say New Zealand. Okay, so I write a case study of a company in New Zealand. Why should people in in the U.S. or the U.K. or Hong Kong care about a company in New Zealand? Why would they care? Well, so I find it's really good just the title of your paper should clearly indicate, I think, what the contribution is. So if you look at the titles of my papers, they're always, it's not, this is a story about uh, something happened in New Zealand. Rather, there's a bigger problem. It's something to do with, um, I don't know, uh, uh, it's the sort of theory or the, area. The, the example happens to come from New Zealand, but it's a big topic that I'm talking about. So that's what I think you, that, that's the trick, is that you might be doing research on Bangladesh or Pakistan or India. It's not primarily about that. It's about this bigger problem, and yours is simply an illustration. <coughs> and that's the way I think to sell your work. Because then you're contributing to the field as a whole. And hopefully, lots of people then be interested in it. I find that a better way to go. Can I interrupt with another problem? Yeah. We actually have backing up into, into the next workshop. So, uh, okay. That's it. <laughs> so uh, I just thought I'd list uh, Detmar Straub's. Um, uh, I'll just quickly go through what he said. Because this was being a qualitative researcher, I put what I thought was important. but. He just came up with these uh, th things for um, very similar. So basic idea is interesting. Uh, it's themes that are popular. He's got that one, which is it sort of uh, it fits into the jigsaw puzzle. It has theory. Uh, it has a that's what's positive work. It has a large sample, and does not count the work of major movers and shakers. And what he means by that, you don't be rude. You're not sort of, it's new, but you're not saying everyone else, what everyone else has done is really bad. You know, it's sort of, it's, it's new, but it, it sort of fits in. So, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.